be recording this um, meeting. And so it will be available for everyone to um, see afterwards, especially those people who are not um, with us today. Um, so I'm Becky Jones. I'm part of Straw Dog Writers Guild and our co-host is Molly Moss from Forbes Library. We're co-sponsoring this event. Um, when we're in person, we get to be at the beautiful um, conference room, but this allows a far more um, many people to come. So um, tonight there are 12 readers. Giovanna Von Pelt is our um, MC for the evening. She will be introducing speakers. I will be posting in the chat their bios and where you can buy their books. I'm encouraging them to hold up their books before they read so that we can see what, what it is they're reading from. And um, the other um, things that I wanna say are, is that after we're done, um, if you're still with us, we welcome you to join in on a conversation with our um, readers. We will stop spotlighting at that point and we will stop recording at that point. Um, we can't spotlight more than a six at a time. So it just didn't seem like it made sense to try to keep that up. And, um, but you can, you can change how you view things. So when people are spotlighted, you can change it to a gallery view up in your upper right hand corner of your computer or when it's we're all on the screen if you want to see who the speaker is you can click on speaker view up there and it will shift between those um, just maybe two other things one if you care to contribute to straw dog writers guild i'm going to put a, a link into the um, chat uh, with a um a an email address um a link so where you could donate and um i want to say um our upcoming events, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat just to our website generally. Next up, February 1st is Writer's Night Out, and Aiden Thayer will be our featured reader. And then on February 9th, Nancy McCabe will be um, doing a program on creating um, creative solutions to writing essays, I think is something like that is the title. And um, I will put the registration to that event on the, um, in the chat as well. So without further ado, I um, put you to mm -hmm. Giovanna. Thanks, Becky. I thought uh, Molly might want a few words first. Well, she had said. Uh, um, yes, no, okay. The only thing I'm gonna do is mute everybody and then Giovanna, you're gonna have to unmute yourself again. I can, I can manage that, I think. I Great. Um, well, welcome everybody. And I'm glad that you could join us tonight. Obviously, we are not in the beautiful Coolidge room at the Forbes Library, but I hope that this Zoom format allows you to take advantage of the fact that you can um, pour yourself a tasty beverage, sit back in your most comfy chair with your slippered feet up, and enjoy this great variety of writers and readings that we'll have for you tonight. Um, I will be keeping track roughly of time. All of our readers have five minutes. Um, and so we ask you to stick uh, as close to that as you can. And I will um, not be too strict about it, but keep an eye on the time for you. And as Becky said, she's gonna post all these great bios and website addresses and uh, information in the chat. So I'm going to keep my introductions very short and keep the traffic flowing. So with that in mind, our first reader tonight is a frequent and favorite at the uh, open mics. His most recent published book of poetry is Abracadabritude. And I can't think of a better way to begin our evening together than by introducing Chris O'Carroll. Thank you, Giovanna. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, like many poets, I wrote my share of pandemic poems over the last year or two. Happily, I'm only going to read one tonight. Uh, this is In Praise of a Pandemic 2020. Earthquakes shatter California. Twisters wrench at the Great Plains. Every year, the Gulf Coast suffers new assaults from hurricanes. 
With our far-flung friends and families, we feel worries crowd our minds. Mortal dangers extra scary when we fear so many kinds. Thanks to you, COVID-19, we now have less to keep track of. Everywhere, just one convenient killer stalks the ones we love. And from a death poem, let us segue directly to a love poem because, you know, love. This is public service announcement. Ideally, this embrace would be just me for you and you for me. Even if we assumed we could, there would be no necessity to brew it. Hey world, love is good. That would be widely understood, would shine in several billion eyes. But as things stand, we feel we should go public, skywrite, advertise what would be private otherwise, the corny, horny truth that two becoming one can symbolize, just you for me and me for you. If we asserted that we screw for world peace, it would not be true. And yet, we do. We do. We do. And this next one is a baseball poem. I, I wrote this after Major League Baseball announced that it was removing marijuana from its list of forbidden substances. This is Toke Me Out to the Ball Game. The outlook was like brilliant for the Weedville Nine that day. They vaped some prime sativa, ergo ultra psyched to play. When Weedville got the munchies, there was never any doubt that vendors stocking Cracker Jack and peanuts would run out. They ditched the anthem for a mellow dose of Grateful Dead. The game was not a contest, but a work of art instead. The physics of the knuckleball for once made perfect sense and home runs rocked the happy math of arcs above the fence. A runner with a lead off first could slide through hyperspace to wormhole past the tag and wind up safe at second base. With Bolshoi ballet grace, the infield turned its double plays, while journeyman outfielders were reborn as Willie Mays. The talent was all golden glove, Cy Young, and triple crown, so everybody got their ticket punched for Cooperstown. The mojo of the game enacted cosmic majesty as baseball truth converged and merged with baseball fantasy. The players all flew higher than a patriotic eagle in celebration of the news that cannabis was legal. And <clears throat> I will finish up with um, postcard from the afterlife. How cool is heaven? Where do I begin here? The nightlife's hipper than pre-war Berlin here, yet wholesome as a cozy country in here. I'm suave as Cary Grant or Errol Flynn here. I've got broad shoulders and a dazzling grin here, plus perfect hair, flat abs, and strong cleft chin here. We all look like some sexy film star's twin here. Nobody hates the color of your skin here. Yang enjoys perfect harmony with yin here. The food is rich, yet all of us stay thin here. Nobody has to lose for me to win here. No politicians practice crooked spin here. I never get hung over from the gin here. None of my favorite vices is a sin here. Damned if I can tell how I got in here. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you all in heaven. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. And, and what a delightful way to start. Our next reader is Nina Daybeck. She has a collection of linked short stories that came out in 2021 called My Father's Wife and My Daughter's Emu. Welcome, Nina. Hi, thank you, Giovanna. And I wanna thank Becky and Molly also for making this happen. And also thank everybody, everybody that I know who's on this Zoom and everybody else too for coming. So, um, so this is the book and I'm gonna read um, from the first two sections of the title story. 
And that's my father's wife and my daughter's emu. One, the wife. My father lay on his bed, propped up with some pillows behind him. His beard had grown quite long. Apparently, he was waiting to get a shave from his barber back in New York. From the moment I brought him to the nursing home near me, he had been extremely angry. He had only one thing on his mind. He needed to get back home to New York City. He didn't belong in this place. He had business to take care of in Manhattan. This was a place for old people, crazy people. He was not one of them. New York City. Yes, he missed New York, but what he really missed was himself. And I could not restore himself to him. Know me. How are you doing, Dad? Terrible. You must take me back to New York. I can't stay here. I have business to take care of. Dad, I know you want to go back to New York. You know? He raised his voice. Then do something. I have urgent business matters to attend to. Little drops of saliva sprayed from his mouth. Besides, my wife is in New York. She doesn't know where I am. I'm sure she's worried about me. The wife was new. I didn't know what to make of the wife. Dad, are you sure you have a wife? What are you talking about? Of course I have a wife. She's a very important person in New York. She runs a hospital and an apartment building, three apartment buildings, one of them with a pool. Talking about the importance of his wife seemed to have a slight calming effect on him. Maybe it was the swimming pool. I'm not sure I've met her. What are you talking about? Are you stupid? Of course you've met her. What could I do but enter into the delusion? Oh yeah, maybe I have. What's her name again? We couldn't, either of us, come up with her name. Two, the emu. When I returned home, my younger daughter, nine-year-old Lily, was interested in hanging out with me. Great, I said, what should we do? In her hand, she held her favorite stuffed animal, the small and very appealing baby emu that she had named Emmy. You decide, Lily said. We were sitting in the living room at either end of our sofa. She threw Emmy at me and I threw Emmy back to her. We can do whatever you'd like, I said, but you have to decide. I don't know, I can't decide. Should we list some possibilities? You list them, she said, throwing Emmy to me once more. I held Emmy up, legs dangling, and turned her to face toward Lily. Lily, I said in a squeaky voice, this is boring. Mommy shouldn't decide. You figure out what you want to do. And that was the first time Emmy spoke, but it would not be the last. Lily brightened. Emmy, what do you want to do? Me? I answered for Emmy. How would I know what to do? I'm only an emu. You're going to have to come up with an idea on your own. You're just saying that because that's what mommy thinks. Well, obviously, said Emmy. The phone rang. It was the nursing home. Hello, I answered in a high-pitched voice, realizing too late that I had just answered the phone as Emmy. It was Sue, the very kind nurse on my father's unit. My father wanted to talk to me. She put him on. Know me? Hello, Dad. What's up? I was just checking to see if you called my wife. I wasn't quite sure how to respond. I called her, but I didn't reach her, I said. Are you sure you had the right number? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. What was the number? I don't remember. I uh, would have to look it up again. 212 something. Okay, I'll wait. You look it up. Although I could have just made up some random phone number, for some reason I thought I should strive for a certain degree of verisimilitude. So I carried the phone with me to my study and fished in my filing cabinet for the number from his former residence, an SRO in New York. Okay, Dad, here it is. I read it off to him. Yes, that's right, that's the number. So did you leave a message, he asked. There was no answering machine. What are you talking about? Of course there's a machine. Well, it wasn't working, maybe. The phone just kept ringing. That's odd. Don't worry, I'll keep trying. I'll let you know when I reach her. You, you don't need to call me again. That was the key piece of information I wanted him to retain. Love you, Dad. Love you, too. When I spun my chair around, there stood Lily, holding Emmy straight out in front of her, about one foot from my face. 
you want Emmy to speak? I suddenly felt extremely fatigued. Lily retracted the hand that held Emmy and then pushed it forward again. Lily, just because Emmy's not saying anything, it doesn't mean you can't. Lily remained silent. Cat got your tongue? asked Emmy. Huh? Did the cat get your tongue? repeated Emmy. What does that mean? What cat? asked Lily. It's an expression for when someone's not talking, like you weren't, said Emmy. How does Emmy know that expression? I know everything mommy knows. Mommy and I, we have a special kind of telepathic thing going. So are we going to play a game or what? Thus, on the same day, I became saddled with both my daughter's and my father's expectations that I would somehow meet the narrative demands that arose from their yearnings. Thanks. Thank you, Nina. I'll remind everyone that they can post comments and feedback for our authors in the chat, and please feel free to do so. Um, that makes me want to practice talking like an emu at some point. So lovely <laughs> work. Thank you, Nina. Our next author has her deep roots here in Western Massachusetts, but uh, is now a greater Bostonian, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, she published a memoir in this past year at, entitled Grace Street, a sister's memoir of grief and gratitude. Please welcome Maureen Callahan Smith. Thank you. It's um, so special to be with all these Western Mass writers. <laughs> um, I am reading from Grace Street, a sister's memoir of grief and gratitude. Uh, it's a memoir of walking next to my sister, my younger sister, as she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and was treated and then had a bone marrow transplant and subsequently died about a year later. Um, it's sort of a book of, of kind of getting through the thing that you never thought you could get through. Um, sisters, family, love, two weddings, um, creativity and spirituality sort of all getting you through. Um, I'm reading from a chapter called Springtime. Kathy had spent 53 days in a noisy stainless steel and fluorescent lit cubicle, her sole window facing a cinder block wall. Driving her home from the hospital, I yielded to an instinct to divert our route to stop by the pond near our house. I pulled up close to the water, sparkling on the soft April morning, the air chill but blazingly sunny. I switched off the motor and opened the windows and we sat in silence. Bundled up in a winter parka and fleece cap with a blanket across her lap, Kathy's face behind the surgical mask was paler than the clouds overhead. We were still for a long moment and I could feel her drinking in the scene before her as if pulling in sweet, cool water after a long drought. She sat without moving or speaking, taking in the sustenance so long denied, which the natural world offers us in every single moment. Today's offerings made in its sublimely beautiful April close. Early spring was just breaking out. The pond newly thawed reflected the optimistic blue sky. The trees in various stages of bud the very air moist and bright after the filtered air of the hospital room. I sat beside her and felt her encounter with this fairly typical spring moment unfold as if for the first time. Felt her stunned to silence, like one who'd been dwelling in a cave or inside a blindfold all these weeks, and therefore receiving the world, feeling it, being acted upon by it as if receiving a sacrament. Ducklings glided past us. Young moms rearranged squirming toddlers in their strollers. 
The sky beat down on us, its steady, sunny blue. We sat and sat. I didn't even glance at her, only stared ahead, not wishing to impose myself on this private reunion she was having with the world. Moments passed that felt eternal. Was it 10 minutes or 60? Neither of us broke the silence. We only sat and stared, the awe in her stillness so palpable that I too was enveloped in it. As battered as she was by what she had just been through, getting the chance to visit with the ducklings, the shoots, the pale beauty of early spring made me hope that just like the new growth exploding all around us, she would only gain from here, growing stronger from this morning on and go on for years, hopefully to experience enough onsets of spring to perhaps even fall back into taking them for granted once again. As it turned out, that isn't what happened. And because of that, I find myself visited now and again by moments that feel of a piece with that one by the pond. On a fine spring morning, a question will suddenly cross my mind. I wonder how many more April I have. A question that surely could seem morbid if dwelt on for too long it is not so scary when administered in gentle, even homeopathic doses. A question that can bring forth a different me, a less distracted, more present me. And suddenly I am back there at Kathy's pondside reunion with the sky and the plants and the birds and the babies, thanking the evergreens, blessing the sky, breathing in the budding leaves. I'm sure there is a roomy poem about this very thing, or maybe 40 of them. Our time here is short, wake up, wake up. But those poems, they're about Rumi's moments. And Rumi wasn't there that morning with Kathy by Spy Pond. This was Kathy's moment. And through her wordless response, became mine too. Maureen, thank you for that lovely writing. So many of us are dealing with more than our share of grief and loss these days. And these are words that we can all embrace. Thank you. Our uh, next author has a most recent book called Old Stones, New Roads from Main Street Reg Publishing. And I'm trying to look, is it, is it fiction or stories? I don't, I don't see what the genre is. So Susanna, I'm sure will tell us about that. Please welcome Suzanne Rancourt. Thank you. It's poetry. And you're, you're best off acquiring the book directly from me, actually. <clears throat> Exposure. I made a point of remembering the silence inside the car, driving southwest, sun brilliant and warm. <clears throat> Impetulant crosswinds tossed my car to the right shoulder of spring-tangled weeds and chain-linked interstate fence where wind captured and inflated a steel gray plastic shopping bag that waddled the size of a wild turkey, scratching for grubs in fresh thawed soil. The red-tailed hawks herald this breach of cover. A long winter teases us into Sierras. Letter to self. <clears throat> a brine blowing up from methana. Arched white caps leap dolphin-like toward crows that dare to fly across them. Seagulls evacuated. Pregnant cat vanished. A storm heavy with viscous clouds. 
The sharp salt abrades the wallows of my face, stiffens my white hair. The strands marble their way to below my backside. A timeline the wide tooth comb lineates, shakes salt grains loose, sprinkles crystal rain, this ocean absent at my birth. A fish out of water, I'm told as a Pisces and a dry birth. The irony was not lost. The cord around my neck, the shroud of call sealed my alto relievo face. I have to be more like the ants, perhaps, that continue regardless of obstacles. I remember being drowned repeatedly by older siblings, swimming under water, eyes wide, knowing I could breathe, a miracle I survived, I'm told. This next poem is a bit longer. Okay, it's a lot longer. You can close your eyes, it's okay. The Olivia that I'm referring to is from that uh, show called The Waltons. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sure they've got reruns somewhere on Netflix or something. Ode to Olivia, Mama, and Me. I wake, dreaming in black and white of Olivia Walton. She glides her right hand over her honey-spun French twist of hair, left hand smoothing her soft-worn cotton bib apron cinched at the waist. Her short-sleeved house dress implies a warm day. Her feet flash brown, leather, thick-heeled shoes that thump hollow up the veranda steps and across porch floorboards. A screen door squawks open, clabbers shut with a slam and quick secondary bounce, and Olivia is gone, the sole of her thin-laced shoe eclipsed. Her right calf barely escapes the snapping jaws of a spring-hinged door. Mom loved Olivia like the mother she saw electrocuted, like the mother she ached for in absence, death carved a need that mum in her delicate fingered exuberance twirled a French twist of chocolate hair now natural white, like Olivia, she'd say, with a slight toe dance, offered to the full length bathroom mirror. Mum, born and raised on a full working farm. Fruit, vegetables, eggs, milk, and meat. Mum could wring a chicken's neck. The Waltons, Mama said, was everything I had, didn't have, and wished for. A matriarch, Mum created family. And when she died at home by the stairs under the brass wall lamp in the hospital bed she hated, the spirit of family went with her. There was no replacing the mother who did steady cartwheels around the house, us kids chasing her like dogs after bicycle wheels, the mother who could stand on her head forever or put 12-gauge shot into a horny man's ass or split wood as good as anyone. Born the year of the horse, like Dad, they were a team. An empty harness is an uneven load, is a burden of absence we all carried in silent mementos and dreams. Mama was a seer, a dreamer, and the closer to death she got, the more she saw, until one day she said, Susie, I'm seeing too much, I can't rest. Dad helped me make a dream catcher. It hung on that brass lamp with the braid of sweet grass. 
Mom slept easy after that. This morning, before my eyes opened, I saw Olivia and Mum being Olivia. I acknowledged death, its jolting screech, like seized engines from pistons thrown, or the menacing zing of circular saws at Grandpa's lumber mill, stopped solid by hardwood knots, or girls on bikes struck dead by chrome bumpers, or first loves with broken necks thrown as a wild curveball, or dreams scraped like decals of hope from a windshield spider cracked by a quarry truck hauling progress one pebble at a time. Suzanne, we're at seven minutes and change. Oh, I'm almost done. Oh, all right. Nostalgia is not grief transferred from mother to child or a synesthetic epiphany or a juncture of enlightenment or the resonance of aligned time. Simply, I'm in my mother's dreams 20 years after her death and I've been here before. I miss the old fireplace on the middle lawn by the merry-go-round. Mum reclined on her side, me sitting cross-legged, waiting for the snakes to approach us. My dreams, Mum's dreams, are a place where this one moment is all moments, an electric arc of connections that snap a crackle, like drops of water and hot bacon grease in the Griswold fry pan. In this space of parallelism exists the interlocking of lives, thoughts, words, actions. Can we change what we give our children? Before my first coffee of the day, I'm thinking about Olivia and Mama. My wind hands breeze up through a caramel tornado of hair. I step into the kitchen, rattle the kettle, cast iron spider atop the gas stove. I look out onto the porch through the screen door. The birds are feeding in the rain. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very powerful imagery. Great description. Our next author writes in many different genres, but his most recent book is a collection of linked stories called Stumbling Through Adulthood. Please welcome John Shire. Thank you, Giovanna, uh, and thank you to Becky and the Straw Dog Writers. Uh, thanks to Molly and Forbes. Thanks to everybody in the audience for being here. This is so much fun. And thanks especially to the other authors here. Um, it's wonderful to live in a place where it's so, so rich with uh, a variety of authors. I've got some of their books right here. I encourage you to get as many of them as you can. Um, this is my book, my newest book that I'll be reading from tonight. It's called Stumbling Through Adulthood, Linked Stories. And the links are basically uh, some characters from uh, earlier stories reappear in stories later on. And the one I wanna read from tonight uh, has the character who's probably the least likable character in the entire book. In two earlier stories, he's a minor character who is very unpleasant at work in one story and in his personal life in another story. Uh, but he's trying to change and that's admirable. The story is called Exit. I'll read about the first half of it. Approaching 40, Dave Allister decided it was time to change. He was ready to find a real relationship after years of short but intense flings that always started randomly and ended badly. He was ready to start taking care of his body instead of drinking away his evenings and limiting his exercise to weekend softball games. He was ready to try to understand the world around him after following whatever politician wielded the best insults. He was ready to stop blaming his own lack of advancement at work on the people who earned the promotions he thought he deserved. 
The night before, Dave decided he was ready to make an, the effort that he had assumed other people were making. He just hadn't been able to commit himself until now. Unfortunately, Dave found himself running late for this morning's project management training session that he decided was the first step toward those life changes he was certain he was ready to make. That's why he took the curving exit ramp leaving Interstate 40 close to twice the posted speed limit. He was annoyed with himself for slightly oversleeping and developing his new uh, and delaying his new program of self improvement and his irritation weighted heavy his foot on the gas pedal. So it was almost a miracle that he was able to stomp on the brake and stop just a dozen yards short of the minivan lying upside down halfway along the ramp, its front wheel still spinning. His seatbelt dug into his chest through his suit jacket, shirt, and tie as the car skidded sideways, tires screaming on the pavement. Random papers, fast food breakfast wrappers, coins, and other meaningless objects flew forward from all parts of the car, including something heavy and hard that he couldn't identify as it struck right behind, or excuse me, as it struck behind his right ear, pinging his brain like a random text message. His cell phone impacted the windshield and landed face down on the passenger side floor. Dave could tell without looking that the phone's face had shattered. Singed rubber burned his nostrils. Then he saw her. The woman crawled out from the overturned driver's side of the, of the van, her dark hair in disarray, half her shirt tail pulled from her jeans. She stood on wobbly legs, staggered forward for 30 feet, and knelt on the pavement. A solid six, Dave thought, and then he mentally slapped himself. Rating women by their appearance was another character trait he knew he should change. Dave removed his seatbelt and opened his door almost before he realized he was moving. He ran toward the woman and skidded on his smooth dress shoes uh, like he was, uh, excuse me, he ran toward the woman and skidded on his smooth dress shoes like she was home plate and he was trying to beat a strong throw from the outfield. Are you okay? He shouted as he slid beside her nearly horizontal. Jesus, the woman shouted back, startled by Dave's sudden appearance. Dave saw fear in her dark eyes. Back seat, the woman said between coughs as she waved an arm toward the van. Dave thought she seemed both confused and certain, an odd combination. In the back seat. Dave rose and ran again, reaching the van with five long strides. He bent to look in the back seat, but the glare made the window opaque. He dropped to his knees and leaned up against the window with his hands alongside his face, making a dark tunnel. The first thing he saw was the shattered window on the other side. Then he saw the upside down armrests of the back seat. Then he saw a neatly closed umbrella lying on the inverted roof. And then he saw a child's booster seat, empty and unmoored, overturned near the broken window, the straps dangling free. He swiveled toward the woman and shouted, where's your baby? What? She called back as she tried to stand. Dave rose and sprinted toward her. Your baby, he screamed. Where's your baby? Before he could finish the word, the toe of his dress shoe caught on a deep crack in the pavement. He found himself suddenly airborne, lurching forward, arms outstretched like wings, feeling an instant sense of weightlessness, as if he could glide like that forever. That illusion swept away, slipped away as time kept its inevitable pace and gravity tightened its unbreakable grip. His right knee landed first, and he could feel his fancy slacks ripping hundreds of dollars worth of cloth disintegrating as the jagged pavement clawed at the fabric. And I'll stop there and sort of leave you hanging. Um, a couple of, uh, one quick spoiler, there was no baby. There's no baby in danger. Um, uh, I hope you weren't worried about that. Uh, Dave's the only character in Stumbling Through Adulthood who literally stumbles um, and his stumble kind of interferes with his plans. And I hope you would like to hear what happens next to Dave and what happens to all the other characters in the book. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, John. That's very evocative prose. Our 
next author is a retired teacher with a forte in nonfiction. His recent book is called Chosen Family, Men's and Women's Support Groups, An Inside Look. And we're pleased to welcome Tom Wiener. This is the cover. And a shout out to Patricia Lee Lewis, who wrote a fabulous blurb on the back of the book. Uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be with my fellow authors, to the organizers and to this audience uh, to share about Chosen Family, whose arrival was impacted by the pandemic. I shall begin by telling you why I wrote the book. First and foremost, to pay homage to my men's group that has been going since 1978, 44 years and counting. Our history, our commitment, our love for one another that includes both endless empathy, compassion and support, as well as challenging one another. Then there's the laughter, the silliness, the celebration, the outstanding meals we've offered one another, the retreats, and much, much more. Another reason was to acknowledge and affirm three other support groups, an older and a younger women's group and a younger men's group that are all in the book. Another reason to show through the words of the 28 people interviewed from the four groups, how impactful such groups can be, how much life-changing affirmations, connections, support, challenge, and love these mini communities provide in a world increasingly isolating, often alienating, and certainly where ne there's never too much, let alone enough mutual caregiving and taking. And the final reason I'll give tonight, although the uh, introduction gives many more, to provide a history of women-inspired support groups, starting with consciousness-raising groups in the 1960s, and then to offer personal experiences by my interview subjects about the origin, formation, group norms, contributions of members, what members receive, the impact of the group on the individual and their relationships with partners, children and parents, changes over time and eventually dealing with conflicts that arise within the group. What makes the book most meaningful are the words of the group members. So I will now treat you to the few of the many moving testimonials. Given the time limitations, I'll share one response from each of the four groups. Choosing is incredibly difficult, but here goes. The question that I asked this young man, Ben, was why did you join your group? The practice of sharing has been critical, he said. One of the features of patriarchy and toxic masculinity is the feeling that a lot of the traits and habits are my own. Thoughts about sex or about women or the inability to be in relationship. Then I pathologize my own issues. So coming together and sharing in a group lets me know there are others who have similar feelings and tensions. Healing must be done as a system, collectively. So I joined a men's group, recognizing that transformation is not a solo endeavor. It requires being in communion with others. This group has been a collective body to struggle, share, and practice together. Being with other men promotes the understanding that transformation and healing cannot be done solely on my own. I feel a heightened urgency and desire to connect with other men about how patriarchy shapes our relationships to ourselves, others, and the world. Next question I asked in this brief sharing is, what is your contribution to your group? And Sarah of the older women's group said, first and foremost, I show up. I prioritize the group in my calendar and work hard to fend off other commitments so I can be there for my women. I also bring my organizing and planning energy for outings to beautiful places and creative projects. But really, it's about what we all bring collectively, leadership, love, listening, wisdom, humor, presence. I think what I contribute, which we all contribute, is that we listen really deeply. And we share a commitment to help each other grow into the best people we can possibly be. We have so much intimacy, which includes being aware of each other's flaws and of our own. We can be fully human with each other and still feel loved and accepted. And the next question, how does being in your group affect who you are and how you act in the world? And this is from the older men's group, Robbie. Being in our group affects me tremendously. I feel that I have total validation for being the man that I am, which is a non-macho man, a non-violent man, a feminist man by being in this group. We get constant support from each other. I have a place in my, my life where I can share things with other men. I think that's really healthy because so many men 
hold things in and don't share intimate emotions with other men. If they're in a heterosexual relationship with a woman, that might be their only place to share that. But I feel like a healthy relationship is to be able to share your deep emotions with a member of different friends and men and women in your life, rather than have it just be for one person, your most intimate partner. I feel the group has given me a healthier perspective on myself. And finally, a young woman answering the question, how do you see the role of support groups in society? Liz said, it is more important than ever because in this country and a lot of countries, we're becoming so fractured and unable to talk to each other. We're standing in our idea boxes. Even if you're doing it in concert with a group of people that is more likely to share your values and ideals than others and feel like family in many ways, if you're able to talk to other people, it's going to make you more empathetic, a kinder person in the world at large, and that energy is going to spread. If you don't have a sense of safety talking to other people, it creates more anger and lashing out and breakdowns than understanding. It leads to destructive and sad behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. The more people come together and participate in conversations, the more healing can happen. That's where I'll end because that's <clears throat> what the groups all say their group provides for them, even more so in a pandemic. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tom. Very, very important work for all of us to take note of. Appreciate your sharing it. Our next author has created a work that deals with an unimaginable event. This debut collection is called what I should have said, a poetry memoir about losing a child <coughs> to addiction. Please welcome Lynette Sweeney. Thank you, Giovanna. Thanks everybody. I'm so honored to be in this group of incredibly talented people. And I really love Straw Dog Writers Guild. It has uh, really supported and encouraged me through what has obviously been a terrible time, but um, also in the publication of this book. So I'm gonna read two poems from the book and then I'm gonna read one poem that I did that I wrote today. So a really brand new poem. So I'm uh, black and white is the first poem from the book. And it, it starts with a little epigraph from the New York Times. Uh, the headline is in heroin crisis, white families seek gentler war on drugs. And the quote is the way I look at addiction now is completely different. I can't tell you what changed inside of me but these are people, they need help. By Eric Adams, an ex-narcotics cop turned treatment coordinator. Black and white. When your kids were addicts, we called them animals, junkies, crack whores, super predators, garbage. When our kids were addicts, the New York Times labeled them substance use disordered, heralded their humanity. When your kids were in pain, Doctors didn't believe them, so prescribed fewer narcotics. When our kids were in pain, doctors didn't want them to suffer, so doled out pills with largesse. When your kids sold weed, their pled down punishment included permanent ineligibility from student loans. When our kids sold rainbow bags of pills put out at parties, police urged us to put them into treatment. When your kids went to court, we buried them without a backward glance, made up long minimums, three strikes. When our kids went to court, judges bent over backward to get them rehab, stayed sentences, clean records. When your kids got caught with cocaine, entrepreneurially turned into crack, we built more and bigger prisons. When our kids got caught with cocaine, well, never mind. Our kids had no cops busting down their dorm doors. No one threw our kids to the ground, kicked their legs apart, knelt on their necks when they protested. Instead, we wondered why our kids were throwing their good lives on the same trash heap as your kids. We barely noticed how your kids' lives had been made dispensable, their futures trashed, until our kids started dying. And the next poem I'm going to read 
I'm very excited to say has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize by Finishing Line Press, which published the book, uh, Breaking Down at Cape Netic. Pebble Cove is a stretch of striped stones. What our beaches looked like eons ago before the endlessly patient waves stroked the rocks into soft, fine-grained submission. Each stripe in each rock is made of the matter that makes us, matted down to a thin strip of circling color wrapped around a cold egg shape, each a reminder of our place in the eternal turning in the eras before commerce, before gathering, before fish, in the cold infinity in which there was rock and this water pulled up by the tireless moon, then cast out a glittery net floating down. The tide like a deep breath draws in slowly, sifts through its jewels, slides over whales and coral and seaweeds, all waving, waving as the net drags by settles to the bottom, pauses, turns, pulls back. My chest opens wide to hold the salt air. The steadfast waves rise up and slam down against the immutable rocks, foaming with frustration at all they haven't been able to break. And the book is divided into the stages of grief and that's in the last section, acceptance. And now I'll read you the poem that I had some sort of brief sketch of it before, but uh, I really finished writing it today. My religion, and it starts with an epigraph. Time spent among trees is never wasted time, Katrina Meyer. I was not raised to care for nature, grown as I was in crowded cities. The most I saw of trees was paper, parks designed by building committees. My mother believed the scenic route was the one with the biggest box stores. Billboards only enhance a commute. Don't we see cities on our bus tours? I rode the asphalt to Queens College where I never even looked for trees. Then a field trip drove me to knowledge. I got off in New Paltz and fell to my knees. I'd never been in a town with woods. My skin sprang alive with the feeling how had I spent my whole childhood looking up to see only ceiling? In the forest, I found religion, filled my lungs with the spirit of sky. I learned there were birds besides pigeons, embraced all I'd been taught to deny. I saw we'd left civilization when we rejected nature as home. We built our roads over creation, poured concrete on buds and sprouts and loam. We'd paved over life's most tender truth, nature's rooted deep down in our souls. Lessons mislead us in our green youth. We're taught to shop, embrace the wrong goals. We're misdirected by construction, keep decreasing what the earth can give. Nature's undergone a reduction somewhere we visit, not where we live. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lynette. Those were great and insightful words. Good poetry. Our, uh, our next author is a teacher and writer here in Greenfield, my stomping grounds. And he has published a collection in, entitled Flat Light. Please welcome Mark Lubers. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight. Um, and uh, just so impressed with everybody's work. Um, I hope I can contribute in kind. Uh, this is the book, it's called Flat Light, my first collection. Um, I'm working on another one and um, hopefully a, a collaborative volume uh, with my friend Ben Galyuboff will be published uh, sometime this year. Um, I have a few short poems to read. Um, this one's about January. Tight month. On the north side of the back house, my bird feeder hangs off a beam, cut plastic milk jug hooked to an unwound coat hanger. I've put in some hard crumbs, but even in this long cold, the local birds won't rally to it. Behind me in the basement, 
the furnace chokes with age around the warped windows. I've stuffed rags in the frames to keep them quiet. Across the yard, juncos forage in the duff under the hemlocks. Nuthatch is prying in the bark of the old maple. In this season, they see the sense of less. They know easy gifts are traps to mistrain us. Pecking in the weeds, they say, get used to getting it later. With their hard eyes, they say, get used to almost enough. Um, I'm guilty, I, I, unapologetically guilty sometimes of anthropomorphism um, and this, this uh, especially with birds for some reason. Um, and this, this poem does a little bit of that too. This is called American Kestrel. She is appointed Artemis, surveying and holding over the dusk median of I-70 in suspension and patience. The taillights trailing away bloodlit, her flight framed in the pulse and stream of traffic, hovering her splayed primaries caught in rushing high beams, flagging me off from her province, miles long and scant feet wide. She is hunting in the margin between come and gone. While she is poised beside the deluded moon in my side window, I hope for her the narrowest of blessings, a sustaining prize in the step of state mown ryegrass, her quarry sheltering in tires, cups, boxes sagging, stained shirt or shoe, the interstate mouse, the pecking starling, red-eyed cicada or dusty shrew, may she take them with reflex and expert eye, wary of fast disaster, close on either side. Um, I also have a tendency to uh, imagine uh, the lives of our artists much more capable and prolific than me, um, and uh, like to imagine um, transformative moments in their lives. Sometimes I call this, and I'm, I'm, I'm using the term coined by a friend, um, speculative biography. Um, <laughs> And this is an example of that. This is called Laura Ingalls Wilder, age five, considers the causes of exile and migration. Having moved with her family from Wisconsin to Missouri for a time, and then to Kansas, before the lease on her father's new farm was revoked for lying on the Osage diminished reserve, she waited in her early girlhood through the blue stem grass, trying both to sway and to stay upright. Behind the gray-brown house, she found nests of fleeing mice who ignored her apologies and appeals to come back. Quail, too, launched from their hatchlings, leaving them to scatter under the thatch, and in her chest, she could feel the percussion of wings. And once, ferrets, which she scared off with her careless steps, and they were like threads of a dream, traceless, slippery in the dim light under the grass and almost gone before one knew they were ever there. Everything leaves, she thought. Grasshopper, milkweed seed, bee of geese, all pushed by wind, cold, hunger, sun, or a shadow beyond reckoning. I think I have time for one more. This one is called Piano Fire, about a local. In a cow flop field up the Trebow Road, old Gasset has a hundred or more, piled and scattered, uprights mostly, players, a few busted baby grands, a battle plane of excoriated, decorated old soldiers culled from barns, emptied from parlors, unsold from estate sales, left behinds, from foreclosures or auctioned off clans grown and moved. The long toothed, exhausted veterans of kids scales, whose breath sing alongs, carols for the deaf, deaf grandmother, and the waltz, the rag, the boogie woogie, far away Broadway, and the tuneless meanders 
of fingers sleepless in the dark. It is senseless work making this collection. Gasset yanks and swears, levering them onto the trailer, up the ramp to the, uh, for the ride up behind the pickup up the hill. Camp now to mice and wrens, once prized ebony lacquers now modeled, standing with splintered warp tops like wrecked tuxedo soiree socialites, tilted and reeling, wearing sprung collars and spattered insults from pigeons and bats. Gap smiles leer from the curved keyboards held in skeletal frames. Gasset says he'll invite everyone he knows up to see when he decides it's time. Grill and swill, haul them all to the middle, huck in a gallon of kerosene and chuck on the smoking end of a swisher sweep. We'll all stand clear of the crash cords, singing strings, moans of failing joinery, skyward flailing sparks, and the chorus of perfect ash and how with joy at all noise, light, and upward endings. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Those were great. My piano behind me is shuddering. <laughs> Someday, maybe. <laughs> our, uh, our next author has had six great success with her nonfiction, but her most recent book is a novel called Burning and Dodging. Please welcome Julie Wittish Schlack. Hi everyone, and uh, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you particularly to Becky for pulling this together. Uh, oh, here's the cover. Actually, uh, the print is by a local artist, Liz Chalfin from the ZMA's gallery, uh, which I encourage you to check out. It feels a bit like Home Shopping Network. Slicers, slicers, okay. Um, so I am going to read uh, an early, a section from an early chapter, Burning and Dodging. Um, the book opens in 2011 when Tina Gabler, who is about 59, has gone to work for um, a, an aging um, TV anchor, a journalist who's writing a book about iconic photographs that had been staged and sees himself very much as the last defender of objectivity and journalism. And yes, I did write this during the Trump administration. Um, but the book um, has lots of flashbacks uh, to various moments in Tina's life. So in this flashback, we are going back to June 1970, when she is out to dinner with her parents, uh, Bob and Joan. And her father, Bob, is um, an engineer for, uh, for television. Two hours ago, you handed your diploma, your high school diploma, and now you just announce you're moving to San Francisco, her father had said with no preamble after ordering a beer for himself, a gin and tonic for Joan and nothing for Tina. She and her parents were sitting tensely around a linen covered table at Mama Maria's for her high school graduation dinner. The argument had started prior night. Tina studied the menu with close attention, grateful for any reason not to have to look at her father's furious face. Dad, it's just for three months. You say that now, but once you're there, you're not gonna to wanna to turn around and come back so soon. And why you will still be here whenever I come back. So you're not planning to start college in the fall. I knew it. I didn't say that, Tina avoided his eyes, but that's what you're thinking. Tina looked past him at the waiters bustling in and out of the kitchen behind him. But she startled when Bob grabbed her forearm. It hurt and she was shocked. Look at me when I'm talking to you, her father barked. Seeing his hand like a clamp, hearing his own hectoring voice, her father released her and took a deep breath. You're a smart girl. You're brimming over with talent. Why do you want to throw it all away? I don't. I'm not. It was oppressive, this love he had for her. She wasn't some kind of prodigy. Could he even see the real her or just his idealized image? You weren't much older than me when you went off to the Air Force, Dad. Nobody said you were too young, she said instead. Well, just like you, the people are going to make history, and I just want to be a part of it. He rolled his eyes. History happens every day, everywhere. All you got to do is be alive, Punham, and you're part of history. Oh, come on, Dad, you know what I mean. You had your war. Well, my generation, we have our anti-war. Bob took a deep breath. I understand. Hell, I sympathize. I'm on your side. I just don't understand why you have to uproot everything. 
when we got plenty of peace marches right here in the city. You could go to school, pop out between classes to chant some slogans, then go back to what you're supposed to be doing. But this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Learning doesn't just happen in a classroom. This isn't some extracurricular activity, Dad. I mean, like debate club. It's not a hobby. Oh, but it is, sweetheart, Bob answered fiercely. Being contrary is a hobby. That's what I learned after over 20 years of listening to my parents and older brothers fight bitterly and always with shifting alliances over whether they should have gone to Palestine or the US when they left Germany in 1933. About whether there could possibly be a God who would allow such a thing as the Holocaust. About whether Dutch Leonard or Bob Feller was the best pitcher in baseball. About whether the Hitler-Stalin pact was a shrewd move to buy the Soviet army time to prepare or a craven anti-Semitic act of isolationism. Joan placed a placating hand on his arm, but he wasn't done. About whether the point or the flat was the better cut of beef brisket. About whether it was great aunt Dora or great aunt Myra who would marry the Gentile in Kiev. About whether the Midtown Tunnel or the 59th Street Bridge was the better route to Seymour's discount warehouse. He paused to take a few gulps from the glass of beer that the waiter had just set down in front of him. And what did all that passionate feeling buy them? Besides the opportunity to feel wounded or superior, who needed the chaos? That speech was probably the longest, most self-revealing monologue her father had ever offered. But at the time, Tina couldn't really notice that. This was probably the first time he'd ever been really angry at her. To be so insulated for so long, she now wondered, was that a gift or a handicap? Last week, you came home from work talking about how television can save the world, she had retorted, feeling her own surge of sour fury. And now you're telling me I'm, what, too emotional? Too much of an idealist? One of my sons is a communist, my mother used to say, one a Trotskyist, and one an atheist. But my baby boy, Robert, he's a realist. Smartest thing she ever said. So listen to me, Bob said fiercely. I don't subscribe to ists or isms. Her mother tried to hide it. But Tina saw her shoot Bob an incredulous look. I don't, he insisted now to his wife. Joan gazed back impassively. Bob searched Joan's face. So you're really not worried, he said flatly. Of course I'm worried. She threw up her hands in exasperation. Our daughter is hell-bent on going to her hippie commune on the other side of the country to do God knows what with God, with God knows who. But I'm trying not to be. She's a sensible girl, Bob. She's grown up in New York City, and she knows how to take care of herself. At the time, Tina could have wept with gratitude. Now she was stunned at how sanguine her mother had been or how unjustifiably trusting. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Julie, for um, making us the flies on the wall at such an interesting dinner. It was great. Our, uh, our next author has published a new work as part of a mystery series. The book is called Working the Beat, and it's part of the Isabel Long series. Please welcome Joan Livingston. Welcome, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Forbes, and thank you, Straw Dogs, and Straw Dog, rather, sorry. And welcome to my writing room here in Shelburne Falls. Um, for the past few years, I've been working on um, a mystery series, the Isabel Long Mystery Series. And number five, um, the, here's the proof, Working the Beat, comes out uh, January 27th. And um, who is Isabel? Well, she's a, a former longtime journalist who uses her skills to uh, solve impossible cases in the fictional uh, Western Mass Hill Towns. Um, she and her mother, who's her partner in crime, um, find the next one at the Titus Country Fair. I'm gonna just start right at the beginning. Thank you. It's a dead night at the rooster, deader than I've ever seen it. There's no band, even though it's a Friday night, but. Jack was smart not to book one. A few drinkers have bellied up to the bar, but nobody lingers long. Neither do the people who come for dinner. Jack's customers have somewhere else more important to go, the tightest country fair. It was the same yesterday for truck pool night. 
That's when drivers, mostly guys, try to get their stripped down, souped up car or pickup to pull as much weight as possible over a line. And everybody in the crowd watches to see if they make or break it. Tonight, horses are pulling, a draw for the traditionalists, and tomorrow is demolition derby night. Jack's not even going to bother opening his bar. Besides, he wants to go like his pals, and he wants me with him. That's what I get for hooking up with a local boy. Right now, Jack and I are sitting at the bar playing poker and listening to tunes on the joke box to pass the time until much later when people will likely show up after the fair shuts down. No booze is allowed at the Titus Country Fair for good reasons, so people will be mighty thirsty unless they've managed to sneak in something. Ready for a hot date tomorrow night, Isabel asks, Jack asks. Are you saying watching cars smash into each other until only one of them is left is your idea of a hot date? He grins as he throws down his cards. Crap, he's beat me again. Uh-huh, what's your idea? He chuckles. By the way, you're one lousy poker player. If we was playing strip poker, you would have been naked a few hands ago. Me, naked in your bar? Jack grins. Not a bad idea. Sure, boss. And so it goes all night. Jack wins hands and we joke back and forth like the fun-loving couple we are. He gives me a wink. Jack's in his late 60s, but he's aged well, likely due to good New England genes and keeping things light. He's a big hunk of a guy who doesn't mind my teasing him about it. He has a square jaw and brown eyes and mostly dark hair. He would make any woman my age, which I'm keeping to myself, turn her head to give Jack a second look. I'm one lucky woman. This November, we will have been together a year, except for a few months after my first case, which involved his late sister, remember? Hooking up with Jack has immersed me in part of the hill towns not experienced by most newcomers, like going to a demolition derby. I would never ever go to one on my own, but I will because of Jack. Besides, it will be a great people watching place. Lots of country folks enjoying a night out while drivers destroy their vehicles in the pit below. Plus, from working at the Rooster, I've gotten to know a lot more people, even some who will be driving tomorrow night, and certainly their fans. I've been hearing about the fair and the derby for a couple of Fridays now when I serve our customers beer or whatever drink they fancy. This will be my first demolition derby, although I've been coming to the Titus Country Fair Every, every year since Sam and I deserted Boston for the sticks of Western Massachusetts. Our kids grew up at the fair from going on the kiddie rides and eating carnival food like fried dough and French fries to teenagers sneaking over the back fence with their friends. Now that they're adults, they still make the pilgrimage to the fair. Ruth and Greg will be bringing my granddaughter Sophie for her very first on Sunday. My sons Matt and Alex said they might see me on derby night it's the hottest thing going this weekend in the hill towns. Actually, I didn't go to the fair last year, part of my year of grieving for Sam, a good guy with a bad ticker. Neither did my mother who moved in with me during that time, but I'm taking her tomorrow afternoon. I've talked about the fair so much, I hope she isn't disappointed to find it filled with the stuff people have grown or made, rides and lots of farm animals. But then again, when her parents came over on the boat from Madeira, they had a large garden and kept goats for their milk and meat. They made nearly everything they needed. Ma grew up a back to earther before anyone came up with that name. For those who have been paying attention, it's been a couple of months since my last case, the one in Dillard where I proved who killed Estelle Crane, the editor and co-owner of The Observer, a small town paper. It's not that I haven't been looking, but nothing offered caught my attention. I mean, I'm not about to catch cheating spouses, although the kill towns appear to have had a rash of them lately, or in one situation, the location of a great grandfather's alleged buried treasure on the family farm. It's the third attempt on the treasure hunt, but no thanks. If my mother and I are going to spend time on a case, it better be an interesting one, like the four we've already undertaken. I am itching to get started on another. Got one? I might be game. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joan. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to delving a little deeper into the mystery. <laughs> 
Our, uh, our next author was a feature at uh, Open Mic and introduced us to the old women behaving badly who show up in her novel. Um, the novel is called Fishwives, and I'm glad we're getting another taste of it tonight. Please welcome Sally Bellwells. Sally, you're muted. Mute. Oh dear. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Straw Dogs and Forms. Forbes. What great readings. I'll repeat myself because they are great readings. Um, I'm so happy to be reading with these authors. <clears throat> I'm um, I'm gonna read a snippet from Fishwives. Um my novel, released in 2021 from Bywater Books, the novel tells the tumultuous 60-year love story of two women, Regina and Jackie, and reveals lots of queer history along the way. Um, this scene is set in 1955 at the Sea Colony. It's a bar that existed in Manhattan and catered to queers, mainly lesbians, in the back room. Regina just got off the bus from a small town and she's visiting her sister, Lynn. Regina has heard about the bar and decides that this is the place to tell her sister, Lynn, that she just can't get herself to like boys. Regina does a bad job explaining because she doesn't understand herself and because she's attracted to the attentive bartender, Jackie. Regina and her sister, Lynn, go through a series of misunderstandings and Lynn gets very drunk and they get caught in a bar raid. The police at the beginning of the scene have just raided the back room. The main character, characters Regina, Lynn, and Jackie are in the more respectable front room. Fishwives, chapter one, 1955. Lynn trips getting out of her chair and walks a straight line to the bar. Regina grabs her satchel and follows. Jackie comes right over, dragging a rag across the clean bar in front of them. Lynn wastes no time asking her, girls dancing? Is that unlegal? Illegal. Girls together, boys together. They say it's a, gr a crime. Jackie skips a beat. Against nature. She stares at the back wall. Sounds like they're getting rougher than usual. Jackie bends to untie her, untie her wingtips and slips into the penny loafer she keeps under the bar. Excuse me, she says. She turns so she's not facing them and takes a comb out of her back pocket. When she faces them again, her slick back hair has been pulled forward and she has a fringe of real cream bangs. I hate to ask, she lowers her eyes, scratches the back of her head and says with a tense smile, can I borrow your scarf, Lynn? What? Lynn teeters off the stool. Regina puts a hand on Lynn's shoulders and makes her sit back down. I need three pieces of the women's clothing. Jackie's brow creases as the noise coming the, from the back room escalates. I keep a couple of scarves and bracelets here. I don't know where they went. Why? Regina unties the scarf from around her sister's neck. Why do you need three pieces of women's clothing? So they can't charge me with pretending to be a man, Jackie says. No dumb girl, Lynn giggles, stops, abruptly serious. No dumb girl, not in America. No girl's gonna think you're a guy, she pouts. Well, I did, for a minute there I did. Shush, Lynn, Regina takes the chiffon, a chiffon scarf from her purse. Unbutton your top two buttons, Jackie, let me. She kneels on a stool and unbuttons Jackie's collar. Try to sober up. Jackie looks sideways at Lynn and Regina as Regina arranges the scarves. You're gonna land in jail if you don't, Lynn. Regina is handing Jackie her charm bracelet when a policeman makes an entrance into the front room. You lost sheep, come to the wrong watering hole. He stands in the doorway between the rooms. We are the NYPD vice squad. Everyone on a bar, bar stool swivels to watch the cop approach the bar. He's a tall white man with a thick, neck. He surveys the hush room with his back to the long mahogany counter. My name is Smith with an E. Sergeant Smith at your service. Keep your noses clean and you might walk out of here with a good story to tell the family back home if you're lucky. 
There's a thud, followed by the sound of glass breaking in the back room. Two bodies struggle in the doorway, bounce against the doorframe, and stagger a few feet into the front room. One is a cop who keeps telling the person he's struggling with to calm down. Enough, Officer Smith bellows, raises his nightstick and brings it down. Shit! The person struggling with the cops falls to their knees. Officer Johnson, Smith's laugh is mean. See that thing hanging off your belt? You got bested by a short, fat girl with your nightstick just dangling there. Officer Johnson unhooks the nightstick, which slips out of his hand and skitters, stopping when it slams into Regina's suitcase. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Sally, for that very vivid scene. It was great. All right, we're up to our last author for the evening, who I have to say has had an enviable year. <laughs> um, he's received national and international acclaim for his most recent translation work and has also published two books of his own verse in the past year. Those are Small Sovereign and Slow Phoenix, all very well-received poetry. And we are delighted to have Michael Favala Goldman as our last author for tonight. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, here's the cover of Slow Phoenix. Um, I'm gonna read a handful of very short poems to finish off this really lovely evening. Thank you all for your offering of all your writing. Um, so as you probably know, uh, Phoenix is a bird from mythology that when it reaches a certain age, it bursts into flames and then is reborn from its ashes. So this is the title poem Slow Phoenix. Sometimes I feel resentful about having my problems. But as the days pass and I don't burst into flames, I'm thinking I have just enough problems to keep me moving. Mortality, for me to be alive, a lot of things have to die. So I try and reduce my death footprint. I go vegan, go barefoot, go home. So life will have less reason for revenge. Status quo. I don't give you the attention you deserve. While you speak, you are a periphery. I admire your shape. Wonder if I might get lucky. I pay attention to the you I created. You go on as if we're on the same page. Discipline. Your mind is distraction. A baby wanting your attention. It's always crying and you care. You're compelled. This may sound coarse, but try letting it go for a while. Eventually, it will calm down when it realizes you're not coming. This is one for the season. January. 
A deep snow fell in the night, too much to deal with. But as the hours pass, unavoidable, might as well start digging. Don't think how long or how much, better how crystalline, how phenomenal, small movements, advancing steps, wind, gravity, shadows and shapes come upon a path revealed. And last poem of the evening, Horizon. Do not worry about a thing once it is done. There are enough swamps in the world for sinking, enough small damp creatures churning the muck and clouded water. Do not occupy yourself with movements subterranean. Become the horizon. It's curved razor slicing the sky. All answers are there on that edge of pain and light. Thank you for listening and for coming tonight and staying to the end, or at least the end of the readings. Um, and thanks uh, back to back to you, Giovanna. Wonderful poems, Michael. Thank you. You pack so much into small spaces, and those were just delightful. So that's that's it for our reading portion. Fantastic job, everyone, and I want to extend our thanks again to everyone who, uh, all of the writers who participated tonight and everyone who was listening. This was really a great evening of words and emotions and so delighted that you could share them. Becky, I'll turn it back to you.